Now we're going to talk about a different kind of interaction that occurs in food webs. So far, we've been talking about consumption, consumptive interaction, something eating something else and the consequences of that for the remainder of the community. Now we're going to talk about a type of interaction that has only really been uh, recognized in the last 20, uh, 30 years that has to do with non-consumptive interactions. That is, what happens to other things, um, that is, what happens when the presence of uh, one species changes some traits or the behavior of another species. These are often referred to as trait-mediated or behaviorally-mediated interactions. And what we're going to learn is that sometimes the consequences for biomass or for lower trophic levels uh, are just as important when, change, when there's changes in behavior and not necessarily just changes in the abundance of particular organisms. So I'm going to give you uh, a couple of examples of this. Uh, one of them is here, uh, done by Oz Schmitz and his team at Yale University. Uh, and what uh, Schmitz was interested in is what happens to the composition of a plant community in the presence of herbivores and in the presence of herbivores and their predators, spiders. Now, classical trophic cascade theory would tell you that when there's spiders around, you should have fewer herbivores, and that should lead to a change in the amount of biomass of the, um, of the plants in these communities. But what Schmitz noticed was that sometimes, uh, even in the presence of the main herbivore, the grasshoppers here, uh, there seemed to be a shift in a pl the plant communities and in the biomass in these communities. So he asked himself, what's going on? Now, the main herbivores in this particular system are uh, grasshoppers uh, right here. And the predators of these grasshoppers are these uh, spiders, uh, either uh, sit and wait uh, spiders like this, um, uh, Pis uh, like this one here, and some jumping spiders uh, like uh, this one here. And there's actually uh, a couple of others. And what he did is he wanted to explore what happens with just the mere presence of a spider in the uh, um, in an arena, so the spiders could have an effect just by their mere presence on the herbivores. And so, in order to test this presence of spider around without having consumption actually happen, that is, the spiders couldn't. Uh, he didn't want the spiders to actually eat uh, the herbivores. What he did is he basically uh, debilitated them. Uh, by clipping off the tips of their mandibles uh, like this, the tips of their chelicery here. And without the chelicery, they can't uh, pierce their prey, they can't envenomate them and uh, paralyze them or kill them, and then slurp them dry the way they normally do. Uh, all they could do is run up to them and kind of pummel them with these stubby little uh, chelicery that are basically non-functional uh, anymore. And they, in later experiments, they actually uh, also started gluing the, the mandibles uh, and uh, you know, had basically the same effects. And what he demonstrates is that uh, this manipulation here of the mandibles actually doesn't have any effect on the mortality uh, of, the, um, of the spiders. The so-called risk spiders, that is the spiders that only could have an effect on the system by being there and providing a, uh, a cue of risk to the herbivores, but can't actually eat them, um, were equally uh, abundant at the end of the experiment as the predation spiders. These are the spiders that could actually go out and actually feed on the, uh, uh, on the, on the herbivores. And so when you look at this plant community here, there are grasses and there are herbs. There's uh, forbs, uh, broadleaf uh, flowering um, plants. In the absence of any herbivores, a one-level system, he could suck out and take out all the herbivores from these, you had no damage to either the grasses or the herbs that were there. This makes sense, there's no herbivores. When you add the grasshoppers in there, you actually see an increase in uh, herbivory, this makes sense, and a little bit of an increase in the uh, damage to the herbs. You know, not as much. Uh, these are grasshoppers that actually prefer the, um, prefer the, the grasses. When you add the spiders that actually are functional, that is, they can actually pierce and kill the, uh, the grasshoppers, 
you see a decrease in the uh, biomass of, I'm sorry, in the damage of the plants, of the grasses. Uh, and this, when you put the risk spiders only in there, that is the spiders that actually can't actually kill the herbivores, you see a decrease in the damage to the grasses to the same extent as you got when you actually have the, um, the actual predation spiders. So just the mere presence of the spiders has an effect on herbivory of the grasses. Now, what you see here is the opposite actually happens to the broadleaf uh, plants, that herbivory actually increases both in the presence of a, the real spiders and in the presence of the risk uh, spiders. So what's going on? Well, here's another consequence of this, um, and that is the uh, when that there's uh, grasses there um, in the two-level treatment. That is, there's only herbivores uh, that are there. There's a uh, a decrease in the amount of grass that ultimately uh, takes over these. Uh, that ultimately is present in these uh, arenas. Um, but then when you add the spiders uh, in, either risk or actual spiders there's a higher percent of grasses. And these are experiments that actually uh, went on for, for a fair amount of time. Um, goldenrods, uh, one example of these herbaceous plants, actually uh, seem to decrease not only with the herbivores there, but they decrease even more when you add the spiders in there. So this is kind of crazy. There's actually a decrease in the amount of one of these species in the presence of a predator that is supposed to be decreasing the abundance um, and the effectiveness of the, uh, uh, of the herbivores. So that's clearly not what's happening. It's happening for the grasses, but it's not happening for the goldenrods. And you can already see where this is going. So as the damage to the grasses goes down and the damage to the uh, goldenrods goes up, there's basically a behavioral shift that the grasshoppers are no longer feeding on their favorite plants, the sweet and juicy grasses. They're actually shifting and moving to the goldenrods, which are less preferred, but is not where the spiders actually hang out and forage. And so they perceive less risk on these plants, and those are the ones that they actually uh, feed upon. I was lucky enough to find this particular video of uh, Dr. Oshmitz actually talking about some of his work and uh, let's listen in. ...determines the makeup of an ecosystem. Oswald Schmitz, an ecology professor at the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, turns that theory on its head. In a three-year-long field experiment, he found that predators have more influence than plants over how an ecosystem functions. What my research is actually showing is that it's the carnivores in the top of the food chain that are determining how much plant material is produced and it isn't simply because the herbivores are changing the way they're chewing the vegetation but it's it's because of the herbivores changing the composition of the plants so you're shifting dominance from highly productive species to less productive species but but a, a greater variety of those species and so you're getting fundamental shifts in in um the, the, the structure of these ecological systems. Professor Schmitz observed that spiders have different hunting modes. It's those modes that cause grasshoppers to behave differently, which has an indirect effect on plants. To just sketch out the experiment, um, it, it involved uh, two kinds of uh, spider predators. One is a sit and wait predator that sits in the upper canopy and sits in the preferred food of the grass. The other is an actively hunting spider predator that roams widely throughout the canopy in search of the prey. So their, their hunting tactics are, are quite different and that causes changes in the way herbivores respond to them. The field experiment was conducted in a meadow up at our research forest in northeastern Connecticut. The experimental cages, the enclosure cages, they're cylinders about uh, three to four feet high. We stock grasshoppers and spiders into these and these these cages are sunk over top of naturally growing vegetation and so we repeat the different kinds of combinations what you call replication of the experiment 
the reason why the, the, the hunting mode, you know, the active hunting versus the ambush strategy are, are useful to understand um, is because you can group all predators, regardless of whether they're mammals or lizards or snakes. Um, um, they, they can all be grouped into th these two broad categories of hunting mode. And so by understanding what they do in these small cages, we can extrapolate to figure out what an elk might do in response to a wolf in Yellowstone Park where the wolves are actively widely roaming predators versus a cougar that sort of tends to be much more of a sit and wait predator, an ambush predator. In the experiment, the prowling jumping spider forced the grasshopper to take shelter in goldenrod, encouraging the growth of other plants. So if we want to protect plant diversity, we actually want to protect the consumers of the plants, which is sort of counterintuitive. You know, if you're going to, if you want to conserve something, you got to remove the factor that's supposedly damaging it. Well, what we're showing is because of the indirect effects that happen, that is by virtue of the carnivores eating the herbivores, the her carnivores have indirect benefits to the plants and we got to protect that kind of dependency also. Just to show some of the data that uh, Schmitz was talking about, here you can see then the consequences of this behavioral shift moving to less preferred plants to the entire plant community that's there. As the amount of goldenrod that less preferred but safe harbor for the grasshopper plant um, uh, goes up here, what you see that is this is when there's only uh, grasses around. What you actually see is that there's less species uh, evenness and less species richness. The goldenrods actually dominate this community. But when you add spiders uh, and risk spiders to the system, what happens is the goldenrod cover decreases here and you get more species coexisting in this community and you get a more even distribution of those species in the community. And that's because these uh, grasshoppers are now feeding on this otherwise competitively dominant uh, plant, even though they would prefer to feed on the grasses. So this was quite a revelation that you can have these massive effects on plant biomass, plant richness in a community, even though nobody gets eaten. So this is a non-consumptive effect of an organism, a predator in this case, on, a, on an herbivore with ramifying consequences for the entire uh, plant community. So this is a behaviorally mediated trophic interaction or a trophic cascade, I should say. This is a behaviorally mediated uh, trophic uh, cascade. And it was quite surprising to actually see how important and how dominant these, uh, these effects uh, were. Another uh, person who did some really seminal work in this particular field is uh, Dr. Bobby Pekarski, then at uh, Cornell University, and hopefully you'll get a chance to meet uh, Bobby, who will be visiting our class. Um, and uh, Bobby is an aquatic uh, ecologist, aquatic entomologist, working on herbivores of uh, aquatic systems. Uh, the things like uh, mayflies and uh, um, uh, other uh, aquatic uh, larvae that feed on algae and uh, other uh, aquatic plants um, and uh, are fed upon in turn by a range of predators, including uh, fish like this uh, wonderful little brook trout uh, here. And if you're a fly fisherman, you know that uh, fish like aquatic uh, macroinvertebrates. And this is actually what you tie on the end of your flies to go fishing uh, for them. And what Bobby did um, is that uh, she ran a very clever uh, experiment where she was interested in a similar question about can the mere presence of a predator change the abundance and distribution of an herbivore? Again, a non-consumptive effect. Nobody's eating anybody. Can this actually be playing out in an aquatic system? And what she did to actually create this environment of risk for the uh, herbivores, for these uh, aquatic insects, was to uh, take uh, trout, put them in a container, have them swim around, and basically mm, uh, create an odor of fish, 
within these uh, containers that then she took and dribbled into a stream where the aquatic insects actually occurred. So there's no fish around, they can't see them, they're not present, all there is is the smell of fish that comes from this fish water that uh, had been steeping uh, these, uh, these live and hungry fish uh, you know, just uh, up the stream. And what happens when you uh, start adding this odor uh, to, the, to the water is you see that the, um, the betas uh, mayflies uh, actually decrease quite significantly in the biomass that they, uh, that they put on. Um, and this is for both the females and uh, males. And this effect was quite strong uh, compared to fishless controls. That is streams that didn't have this uh, essence of, uh, of uh, fish juice that was dribbled uh, on them. And what people have uh, done, uh, Bobby and uh, Schmitz and, and others, is to basically uh, recognize that a very important aspect of uh, organisms' lives is not just to eat, but also not be eaten. So this is a key uh, recognition that uh, these two things are, um, are shaping the behavior and the uh, life history traits of organisms. They've got to get out there and grab resources in order to grow and reproduce and mate and do everything that they do, but they need to do so in a way that makes them not susceptible to getting eaten. And therefore, any traits that they may have that allow them to detect risk in the environment should be adaptive. And, uh, they, and, and on the other hand, you would say, well, wait a second, they're avoiding risk, but at the same time, they're losing a lot of biomass. So there must be a cost to this. Smaller females means they lay fewer eggs. So this must be a trade-off that, uh, that they're willing to make, so to speak, um, because it is so uh, dangerous to get eaten in these environments. Sometimes this is, this, these phenomena are, are referred to as the ecology of fear, that these responses that we would, uh, that we would characterize as a fear response uh, have these uh, important physiological uh, consequences for the organisms. And it's balancing this trade-off between surviving and reproducing and growing and yet not getting eaten. And there's, there's costs to actually doing this. Just to wrap this up, there's a very nice uh, summary of some of these ideas uh, by Mickey Eubanks and uh, Debbie Finke. Uh, you may recognize them as uh, two of the uh, authors of your uh, textbook that um, kind of contrast these two different ways of thinking about uh, food webs. And I'm not gonna read you through this here. Uh, this uh, reading is available in our bonus materials for the week. But again, the, the the early paradigm um, of understanding food webs was to think about how predators affect their, um, their prey. In this case, a uh, natural enemy feeding on an herbivore, for example, which feeds on a uh, host plant. And um, if you look at the directionality of these arrows, this is the classic way of thinking about energy flow in the system. Host plant material gets uh, consumed and assimilated into the body tissues of an herbivore, which in turn gets consumed and assimilated into the body tissues of the, uh, of the natural enemies that, uh, uh, that can find it and, uh, and eat it. And so uh, a lot of the early field of food web ecology was really trying to understand how do these systems work? How do we predict the consequences of having predators, you know, given these types of energetic types of interactions? where somebody eats somebody else and that has a cascading effect on uh, the lower trophic levels. And the, the, this idea uh, you know, in food webs is starting to get much more um, nuanced and more uh, interesting perhaps, where now we're starting to think about the consequences of the interactions. And those interactions sometimes are consumptive but sometimes are non-consumptive. Sometimes they actually just change the behavior, not the abundance of organisms. A consumptive interaction actually 
gets rid of organisms from the community. They just got consumed by something else. A non-consumptive interaction is one where the organisms are still there, they're just doing things differently. So they're behaving differently. Maybe they've grown smaller because they're starving, you know, thing, things to that effect. And that also has consequences for the lower trophic levels. And so uh, as you go here from these types of interactions, uh, you know, when you with these types of trophic interactions, there's actually a much more complex and rich way in which these non-trophic interactions can play out on the uh, on these communities. You can see here there's many more arrows, and there uh, the directionality is uh, uh, you know is different uh, than if you look at them in uh, this way here. And understanding these uh, the nature of these interactions is actually what gives you predictive ability on what happens on the lower trophic levels, not just the uh, direct consumptive effects. So that's the take-home message of these non-consumptive uh, interactions, non-trophic interactions in uh, food webs.